Hi, have a good day, everyone, um, and thank you for attending this talk. Um, today, I will present you something about pitch backrest. Well, most of you may already know me. Um, I'm Stefan Ferco. I'm coming from Belgium. I'm a senior Postgres expert at Data Higret. Um, I'm a very fan of pitch backrest, and I'm one of the contributors behind the tool. Um, you can find me on various networks like GitHub, Twitter, Mastodon, and so on under the PG staff nickname, and you will find on my GitHub pages lots of blog posts about backrest mainly. The idea of today's talk is to, well, talk to you about PG backrest. I've done a lot of PG backrest talks already, so this one will be a little bit more advanced, maybe. So for those who doesn't know PG backrest yet, well, backrest aims to be a very simple backup and restore system, which is important. The latest release has been out for a few um, weeks now, the 2.49. We tend to have a cycle uh, with one new release every two months, approximately. So backrest can operate locally or remotely. That means you can push backups and archives from your process host to a remote storage, like an S3 bucket or something. Or you can use a dedicated backup server to pull your backups. Um, and that's Pulling can be done using SSH or using a TLS server, which is kind of the stuff we are trying to recommend right now because it's been more performant than the SSH connections. Obviously, backrest has the parallelisms when using multiple processes to do stuff and the asynchronous operations for the archiving system that we will see today. Obviously, it supports S3, Azure, Google Cloud storages for your backups and archives, and that comes handy when you have client-side encryption. So you can encrypt your backups and archives before pushing it to the cloud. So as I said, little disclaimer um, today, the idea of the talk is, well, taking the experience of the frequently requested features, the frequently requested questions, or problems that the beginners have when we do support on GitHub issues and so on. So I will probably be assuming that you know the basics of Postgres continuous archiving, how to set it up, how to make a Postgres based backup, the default one, um, and the initial set of, of backrest. So as I said, the idea of today's talk is just looking at the most frequent GitHub issues, the feature requested that we have, the problems that we can have with Postgres archiving and so on, and try to answer those questions with you today. So the first thing that to answer the, what can PG backrest do for you is, well, obviously, using PG receive all. That's probably the most frequently asked question. So we are using the archive command in PG backrest. And yes, the archive command can be slow in Postgres, but we have ways to improve that in, in backrest. So we'll see that today. For the beginners who doesn't really know how the wall archiving system is working. So the wall archiving process, basically, that's very basically said. You have every operation that is logged by Postgres in the wall segments. As soon as the 16 megabytes, which is the default size of a segment, is completed, Postgres will use the archive command to push your wall to the mirror, the archives repo. It can be any command you want, a simple CP, SCP, rsync, whatever you want. And so you have the current transactions in the current wall file, wall segment. So the benefits and drawbacks of each method, you have the archive command, so the archive and process of Postgres, which is very simple to use. I mean, just turning on the archive mode, using the archive command, simple CP, and you're done. Postgres will do that for you. But then it means you can lose that whole segment, because the previous one is pushed to the archives. If you fail your, your, primer, your primary, you still don't have the last transaction there. Well, PG receive wall is a bit more complex. I mean, you need to start the PG receive wall daemon. You need to, well, monitor that it's still running. You need to have a replication slot. So it's a bit more complex to maintain. But it's using the replication protocol to pull your archives while Postgres is generating it. So you only, all those things that you have here will be pulled 
by PGC Evil directly. And it will be stored in what we call a partial world segment. That's just a file that is filling up alongside with the replication that is pulling the data you want. So you can consider PG Receivable as a standby server, but without a data directory. So yes, it can be handy. But usually, the file that you can miss here is just less than 16 megabytes, so very few things. And what is very important, um, that partial world file, when you have a standby server, the standby server is using the replication protocol, so it has those transactions. And that partial file will be pushed into the archives repo by the standby itself when it will be promoted. So you won't need to, well, think about it when you will promote your standby. You will need to do that with PG Receival while Postgres will handle that for you with the archive command. So let's take an example. We have a primary server and a standby one. They are connected into a streaming replication protocol. We will simply use a backup storage, a shared repository. We will use an archive command, a very simple one, and connect a PG receivable to push it to the same storage. So basically, archive command is a basic CP to a, search, uh, a shared storage a PG receivable connected to exactly the same storage. So you don't have performance issue comparing them, it's just the same storage. And you simply start a PG bench activity, a very basic one. What we can see is that, okay, so we have two processes connected in replication. The first one is the replica, the standby, and the second one is the PG receivable. So let's look at the content of the directories. You have the shared archives. So when you look at the streaming replication location, that's the log sequence number of the Postgres, um, well, the actual position in the world records that has been sent to the streaming replicas. So we can deduct from that position the name of the world segments of the current one. So we are on 34. So the current world segment should end with 34. If you look at the archive, that means the 33 was filled and was pushed to the archive by Postgres with the archive command. And if you look at the receivable, well, that's what I explained earlier. You have the completed one, 33, and the ongoing one, the 34, with the partial extension. So yes, in this case, I agree. Backrest, well, or the archive command of Postgres itself is ahead of your is behind, sorry, is behind your PG receivable. PG receivable is having more data. Let's promote your standby. Because, okay, the standby has the same data as the receivable. As soon as you promote your standby, well, cool. We get a partial wall file that is coming in the archives. We didn't touch anything. Postgres did it. And it also comes with a nice file named history file. History file is the history of your timelines in Postgres. And timelines in Postgres, we'll see that in a moment, is that's very important. And at this point, I just promoted the standby. But what did I do with the PG receivable? I didn't touch it. It was still connected to the primary. So if I look into the receivable directory, I won't have that history file because PG receivable was pointing to the primary. So when you have a primary and a standby, I said earlier that PG receivable is way complex, way more complex than the archive command because you need to think about, okay, I need to switch PG receivable to my standby before promoting it. So yes, that makes the, the PG receivable more complex to use. So why are those history files very important? that because of the timelines. Timelines in Postgres is, well, very important because every time you will have a promotion or a recovery um, that, we, that you stop at any point using point time recovery or replaying it anything anyway, you will have a timeline switch. The timeline switch will be part of the wild file name, so you will see the wild file, of, well, three parts. The first part is the timeline. The idea is to let you know 
what are the records that has been generated on the new timeline and on the previous one. So if you have, well, the primary, which is on the first timeline, the standby, which was promoted as a second timeline, if you still write in the first one, you will be able to distinguish what records have been inserted in the first timeline on the primary and which one has been inserted on the second timeline on the standby that was promoted as a new primary. So that's very important to let you know what happened and where. So the history file will contain the history of those timeline switches. What did happen? Was it promotion? What location was it? Was it a, a replay with a stop time? Was it a replay with, well, no stop and going forward to replay everything? So timelines are very important. So when you have, what my, what my feeling is, and I think the other developers of Backrest are agreeing with me, when we have primary and standby situation, don't use PG receivable, you have the archive command, which is just great. So what we also hear very, very, very often is that the Postgres archive command is slow. So let's have a look at that. Is that command really slow? And what can Backrest do for you to help you speed that up? Backrest will offer you a way to have a faster archiving system in Postgres while using the archiving system, an asynchronous archiving system. Asynchronous archiving system, the idea behind that, that's just saying when Postgres will ask you to, well, archive a world segment, Backrest will use multiple processes to go ahead of Postgres. It will look into the, the world segments directories, which ones are ready to be archived, but not asked by Postgres yet. It will take it, use asynchronous processes, to push it to the repo for you. So next time, when Postgres will ask to do that, that's already done. So it's speeding up things. And to speed up even more, we will keep acknowledgement files. We will have just a, a status file into the spool path to a, a local directory, which is just an acknowledgement, just a status. OK, that wall has already been shipped. So when Postgres will need to know if it's done, it won't have a need to look into the repo, which could be a S3 storage and very slow. It's just a local directory. So you're speeding up the archiving system very, very fast, and you're just using multiple processes to do that asynchronously. So that method is very important to help you, well, speed up the archiving system of Postgres. Another tip that we often recommend is changing the compression type, which the default is gzip. Gzip was great, Gzip is compliant with multiple platforms, but now we have, well, at least LZ4, which is very fast, but doesn't compress very much, or we have that fantastic Z standard. Z standard is pretty much my preferred. Um, it's very fast and compress very much. Basically, you can achieve the speed of LZ4 with the compression of Gzip using the Z standard, basically. You can play with compression level, but usually the defaults are good enough. The default JZIP uh, level is six, while LZ4 is one. That's why LZ4 is so fast and doesn't compress very much because <laughs> the default is one, obviously. But the standard with the default three, you can achieve LZ4 one and JZIP six with the Z standard. So if you can use Z standard, use that as a beginning when you set up backrest. So let's have a look. Uh, we are back to our example with a, a, a primary, a standby, an archive command, and a PG receivable. Let's just have a look at the Postgres internals. So PG stat replication, okay, we have the standby, we have receivable, and we have the statuses, which are stand, sent LSN, write LSN, flush LSN. I will get back to that in a moment. We see that the locations are uh, 37, so the current wall is 37, and the last one that was archived is 36. So that's fine, that's our initial state. For those who don't know what are the, well, the statuses I just mentioned in PG replication, PG start replication, well, when you have a primary and a standby, you just see the sent LSN as what has been pushed from the primary to the connection. So it doesn't know yet what is, well, going on, it just knows, okay, I've sent it, but I don't know yet if it's been received. Write LSN is what has been received by the standby. Standby has answered, okay, I've put that in my, 
my operating system cache, I got that information. But that doesn't mean it reached disks yet, because you need to uh, have seen that and then write the cache to disk, and that's the flush location. The flush location is, okay, that has been pushed to disk, finally. So let's now get back to our archiving problem. Is the archiving too slow? So let's use pgbench, a simple, uh, well, a simple process of pgbench, very simple, very, very basic. And what we can see, well, the wild receiver is, so the standby has been pushed 5C and received 5C and flushed to disk 5C. So the standby is keeping up with the primary, no problem. And that's normal. I mean, the standby server is usually in production server, so it has good disks, good memory, and so on, the same as the, the primary, because you want to fail over, so you usually have the same systems. That's normal. Then you have receive wall. Receive wall has been sent 5C, received 5.8. So it's lagging behind. But that's normal. You are pushing to a shared storage, to an archive storage. Usually the backup storage is slower than your production system, so that's normal. What about the archiving system? Well, 4B. So yes, the answer of the question, is the process archiving slow? Yes. Compared to receive wall? Yes. But at the end, if we let Postgres handle it, that's good. I mean, at the end, 5F for everyone and 5E for the archives. So at the end, if we let the process is running and Postgres archives system, not a problem, everyone gets what it needs. So now it's time to see what we can do with Postgres to improve that solution. We now use as an archive command, the archiving command of PG Backrest. And we'll set up just two processes with asynchronous archiving and the standard compression. So very basic. And we run the same PG Bench command. And what we see pretty much immediately is that, okay, we are pushing and receiving 7F on the standby. The receive wall is 7B. So yeah, lagging behind slightly. But, well, the archiving system is ahead of receive wall. 7D. So at this point, what happens if you lose your primary and your standby, the latest data will be in your archiving system, not in the PG receivable system. So just simply by using the tricks in Backrest, we speeding up the archiving system. And that's why we don't need PG receivable at all, because we have asynchronous archiving, which is faster. So that's the first myth that very that is very, very, very often um, asked and requested. So let's now have a, a quick view of what can go wrong with the archiving system. Somebody I know very, very well told me once, well, things can get worse, and it will. When things can get worse, it will. So let's see what happens um, when the archiving system is failing, and what can PG Backrest do um, to help you. Basically, it can... Well, the archive command is, using by, is used by Postgres. And often you will see when you have, for example, the backup command or the check command of PG Backrest, you will see that nice error message telling you, OK, my world segment that I need has not been archived before the timeout. But why? You don't know. Backrest won't tell you. Why? Simply because the archive command is used by Postgres itself. So it doesn't have any log file and information. You need to dig up into the Postgres logs to have the archive push command output and why it is failing. So Backrest isn't very handy with that. You have to know when something is failing with the archiving system. Just have a look at the Postgres logs. Another very common error example that we get um, on GitHub very frequently is, well, unable to find a valid repository missing file or something, so everyone is freaking out. I'm missing a file in my repository. What's happening? Well, did you simply try to perform a stanza create? That is the initialization, initialization step of Backrest to just collect information about your Postgres cluster, store that into some information files into the directories of the repo. So just, yeah, that's very often, um, and Backrest isn't really helping, but it's just a hint have you, think, have you thought about doing that? 
Um, another very common error um, are the locks. Basically, PG Backrest use locks when you take a backup. So that's very easy. If you can't take a backup, if it will tell you I can't take a lock, it's very easy to know. The simple archiving system that is running doesn't need locks because PostgreSQL just run one archive command at a time, so only one archive is pushed at a time. But when you get the asynchronous processes, you need more information to just make sure you only have one archive command of Postgres and then all the rest, um, all the other asynchronous processes. So sometimes people just turn on the asynchronous archiving and just get failing errors that don't work anymore. I didn't touch anything. I didn't touch my system and that's not working. Yeah, you turned on asynchronous archiving and you have locks. So that's also not very handy because Unable acquire lock is a very frequent error and just let people freak out um, because, yes, it was working before, just we turn on the asynchronous and that's not working. Yeah. So that's something you need to know. Okay, so what, happen, what happens when the archiving command is failing? Basically, you are asking Postgres to archive and save a copy of your whole segment. If the archiving command is failing, well, Postgres is smart enough to keep that wall for you. You don't want to lose your data, so Postgres will keep it. So you'll see plenty of ready files. Plan your, your PG world directory will grow because you will have plenty of all archives. And at some point, if Postgres doesn't have any disk space anymore for the world segments, it will panic and stop because it's its way of having consistency. So. Obviously, PG Backrest can't help you with the failing archiving command because you can have a broken repo, you can have slowness or something, but you can at least help you with archiving queue. The idea of the archiving queue, archive push queue max setting, is just giving a limit of the archiving size of Postgres, the amount of world segments that are ready to be archived but not done yet. It just it can be for any reason because you're your repo is unavailable or because it's just too slow. That can happen. You generate so much data that the processes can't follow. Um, the idea of that size, that QMAX size, is just to tell, okay, I've got 10 gigabytes of space on my disk. I can reach that limit. But as soon as you reach that limit, Backrest won't do anything with the archive when Postgres will ask it. So Postgres will ask to archive something, we have more than 10 gigabytes ready. Okay, just drop that. I won't do anything with the archive, but I will tell Postgres, okay, I've done it. So Postgres will be unblocked. It won't panic. It will remove and recycle your world archives. So that's not a problem. Postgres is unblocked. But Backrest didn't do anything with it. It didn't solve the underlying problem, which was your repo unavailable. But it will just say, I've done it, but not. It helps with Postgres but it generates missing archives. So in any way, if you are using that feature or simply not using that feature but having archiving system, please monitor your archiving system. That's very important to just make sure it runs fine, it's keeping up, and doesn't pile up world segments on Postgres to prevent panicking Postgres. So monitoring is very important when you use backups anyway. Um, just before going on, I'm sorry, I need to drink uh, a lot because I'm, my voice is failing me today. Um, <clears throat> so, the next step, I will need to speed up a little bit. What um, Backrest can do for you is doing monitoring. I mean, it's a backup tool, not a monitoring tool. But you still have something that you can look at and that Backrest can offer you as entry points for information. So let's have a look at that. Um, the first entry point that I mentioned earlier already is the archiving command failing. What you will look at, you will look at the Postgres logs. Um, so when you run a command in, in Backrest, you have, when you run the command manually, like a backup command, you have the console output, and you also have a log file. So you can define various levels of details in, that, in those areas. You can have, well, a simple information in the console, 
But it's, if, if it's failing and you don't want to rerun the entire command, which can be a backup taking very long, you can set up the log level file to, well, like debug. So you have, usually what I recommend is using log level console do info, so you have more information than just the warnings, and log, file, log level file to debug, which will give you more insights into the log file directory. Um, so when you run a long command, you don't need to rerun it, you already have the logs. But I said earlier, well, the archive push command doesn't have a log file because it returns the console output to the Postgres logs. What can we do about it? We can use that nice trick in the configuration of PG Backrest. You can add for a specified stanza, so you see my stanza name is demo, for a specific command, which is archive push, a specific setting, log level console to debug. So when your archiving system is failing in backrest, you can simply add that little trick that will add debug information to your archiving system in Postgres directly without ever needing to touch the Postgres configuration or reloading it. It will be applied in the next archiving call directly. So that's very handy when you need to add some logging information. Another common place for having information is the info command. Info command will just give you an overview of what's inside your repository. But that's not very, usually the default one is a text output. And the text output isn't very handy to manipulate with machines, scripts, and so on. So you need to, well, use a JSON output. So you can simply use output JSON that will give you a JSON, a JSON story of what's inside your repo. And that's very stable. We try to not add or change the field names in it, so you can plug in any monitoring system you want and use that. But that's how oh, we can find information in backrest. But what can we? What do we have to look at? We obviously need to look at the backups. I mean, how oh, old is your latest backup? How oh, old is your first backup? How oh, old is your latest full backup? For example, if you take one full every week and incremental backups every day, you need to know when was the last full backup. Um, you can also know how many backup types you have in the repo, like how many full, how many inc, how many differentials. And does all that meet your retention settings? I mean, Backrest will simply take backups and expire the ones you don't need based on the settings, but that does really meet what you wanted. You need to monitor it and make sure it's still uh, applies. So a good example, um, I've used the check PG backrest uh, tool, which is a not just plugin that we can run uh, manually to have a nice human output. It just gives me, well, what was my latest backup? It was an incremental, uh, took three hours ago. When was my latest full? Um, and well, what was my oldest full? My oldest backup is 21 hour. Um, so that's a, just an example, a test example, but yeah, that's important to know. When was your oldest backup? When was your latest full? And what, when was your latest backup? Obviously, we have backups, but you have archives too. Backrest will give you some hints. When you take a backup, PG Backrest will check that the archives you need for the consistency of your backup are saved in the repo. So you will often see check archive or segments and the segments you need for the consistency. So without the archiving system, you can't have a consistent backup, so Backrest will do that. We'll check. The info command can show the oldest while present in the repo and the latest one, but it won't check anything in between. So you don't know if there is a missing piece. What if an, the, the archive needed for the backups are there when the backup is taken and then disappear? You don't know. Backrest doesn't know. Are all the well, archives from the meanwhile segment, so the oldest one in the repo and the latest one in the repo, present there? You don't know. Well, at least Backrest doesn't know, so you need to monitor that. And what's even more important is timeline switches. I mean, imagine you have a, a standby that you promote by accident or something. You have a timeline switch. So your oldest one is on the first timeline, the new one is on the second one. 
At some point, you need to monitor that. You need to know, OK, I need to come from the first timeline to go to the second timeline. But where do I need to switch? When was the switch point? And the switch point can be located in the history file. So you need to look at the history file to know that switch point. And the history file, well, you can simply get the repo get command or backrest to help you decrypt and, and decompress the file for you. Um, you will see, OK, the first timeline switched on E8. So if you look at the log sequence number, you can use pg wall file name to just get the wall file name associated to that location number. You have one E8. So great. We know if we need to monitor, we need to go from 1.99 to 1.e8, and then switch, jump to 2.e8. So when you are doing monitoring, that's important to know. Um, the locking is also important, as I mentioned earlier. If you have a backup that is taking too long, you will have a backup log that will stay there for too long, so that's a good monitoring tip. Um, archive logs. Well, the archive command should be very fast. So if you have an archive log that is taking too long, something is weird with your archiving system. Just put an alert on it. So that's what you need to do to monitor and make sure everything's fine on a production system. So finally, uh, the last step for today is, well, as I said earlier, Backrest is a very good backup system and a very good restore type, restore tool. But Backrest won't handle the recovery. It won't know what do you want to restore exactly. I mean, it can prepare the data. It can prepare the settings. But eventually, that's Postgres that will do the recovery. Postgres will replay the walls. And you need to tell Postgres what to do. Backrest can help you with all the settings and the restore types we have. I mean, you can choose the restore type you want. I mean, do you want the default restore? So replaying all the wall entries and up until the end. Or do you want an immediate uh, restore? So just restore the backup set, replay the wall entries from the backup start to the backup stop, so the consistency point. That's recovery target immediate in, in Postgres itself, so that's immediate type. Or do you want to, well, OK, I know that transaction that deleted my data. I want to stop just before. I can point to a log sequence number which is recovery target LSN in Postgres, um, restore points. If you do migrations of schemas or inserts or something, you can create restore points. Named restore points is very easy and handy to do. And then you can point to that restore point that will set the recovery target name of Postgres. You can even be more specific and go to a transaction ID. If you need a transaction ID that made the deletes, you can point to that transaction and restore before that point. Or you can specify a target time if you want. That's a time temp in Postgres with recovery target time. So yes, Backrest has those nice features, but at the end, it doesn't know what you want. So you need to specify what you want. And it even goes behind that is, well, Backrest by default will restore the latest backup set you have in the repo. If you specify an earlier time, an earlier log sequence number, it is smart enough to detect what backup set it needs to use. It can be the one from last Sunday, for example. But if you are using, well, for example, um, uh, the name, so the restore uh, point, it doesn't know what backup contains the restore point. That's up to you. You know when it was taken, so you need to specify what backup set you want to restore to reach that restore point. That's something you need to know. Also something important with the timelines. Well, Backrest doesn't know what you want to do exactly. And a good example with that is, just imagine the simple situation. You have a backup every night, right? And you have the continuous archiving that is pushing the world archives when they are ready. And then suddenly, so we are 4 PM now, well, not now, but in the example, um, we are 4 PM. And somebody just come to you and tells you, oh, uh, I deleted uh, some very important data one hour ago. I forgot a web clause. Can you help me? Yes, no problem. I've got a nice, nice tool. I've got backrest. I use my backup. I restore it. I point to 3 PM. Even better, I find the transaction that he did and stop just before that. That's nice. Restore. I've got that nice second timeline, but we don't travel in time. I mean, we are still 4 PM, right? 
So you are on the second timeline now, 4 p.m. We switched there, so we have the, the data that has been deleted, but we don't have the data that has been inserted past that point in the second timeline. So everything is fine, the developer is happy, he has the data and so on. But then another developer comes by and says, yeah, but I inserted very important data at 3.30 and I want that back. What can I do? Well, no problem, I've got backups. I will just simply, just simply replay the backup, restore, and replay until 3.30. I will get my, my data. But what happens, do you think? On the third timeline, well, after Postgres 12, the default setting in Postgres is following the latest timeline. So your third timeline will, in fact, switch at 3 p.m. to the second timeline, then go here, and at 3.30, go up on the third timeline. <laughs> so you don't have those data. And the way to do that is to use, for example, the current keyword, which is the previous, com the previous behavior of Postgres. You need to specify to Postgres itself the recovery target timeline, so with the target timeline option backrest, to, well, stay on the current timeline of the backup to get that point and not switch to the latest timeline when they find the switch. So that's very important. Backrest can't know that for you. You need to specify what you want. So the last myth I will unreveal today is something that's very annoying for people coming to Postgres world with the point time recovery and so on. Selective restore. Usually, somebody tells you, yeah, but I just want to restore a specific table in that database, I don't want everything, and I want that in place. I mean, I have a production system, I have a backup, and I want that my restore just push the table inside it. The usual answer is, what you do is that, okay, in Postgres that works like that. You need to copy the entire database, the entire data directory, and you need to restore that entire data directory to just extract with pgdump one specific table in one specific database and then re-import it with PG Restore in your production system. That's how it works in Postgres, right? But Backrest has a nice feature, which is called Selective Restore. The idea is to only pick the database you need. We can't do that with a table because real file nodes are moving and so on. We just need to, we can go to a specific database. So imagine you have 10 terabytes of data, but you separated all the databases correctly, and you specifically need only one of those databases. It's not a problem. You can ask Backrest to only restore that database into a new cluster. With using the DB include option, what it will do, it will restore your data directory, pick only the database you need, and all the files that aren't needed for the other databases will be created, but empty. So the Postgres process for the recovery will be happening. You can replay, you can get your database back, but all those other databases will be just emptied and not reachable anymore. But that's not a problem. I mean, you don't want to erase your production system. You want to have a, another restore, and then you can extract your table and re-inject it in the production system, right? So that's great. The idea is to save time for the restore, and save disk space. Imagine you have 10 terabytes of data and just need one gigabyte database. That's great. You saved a lot of time, a lot of disk space for the restoration. So that's a nice tip, and a nice feature in, in background, the DB include option. You can do that with the DB exclude option too, if you need to include everything except one or two databases. And by default, in the include options, the databases like template zero, template one, and so on will be included. So my conclusion for today is that, well, even though we can't have every feature in the world, we don't really need PG receivable. We have a fantastic asynchronous archiving system. By default, if you can use the standard uh, as compression type, don't forget to monitor your backups and archives. That's very important. And regularly try your backups. I mean, you all know Schrodinger's law of backup that says the condition state of any backup is unknown until a restore is attempted. 
And what I tend to also add to that statement is that a restore is attempted, and Postgres could recover successfully. That's not always the case. So re regularly try to restore your backups and see if Postgres is able to recover. And so that's it for me. Thank you very much. If you would like to test your backup, but not uh, really executing it, so check if all files which are needed are there. Is there an option for that? Well, in Backpress itself, there's a verify command, but the verify command won't tell you if Postgres is able to recover. <laughs> I mean, the idea is to, yeah, know that all the files you could need are still there in the repo, but will still Postgres be able to recover? That's another question. So even though you have the verification with all those files present and so on, the manifest, the checksums and so on, it doesn't guarantee that when Postgres will start, it will work. So my usual recommendation is <laughs> always do a full restore and a full recovery to make sure it happens. And even go further, make sure it goes to the point, to the latest point you want it. That's also a trap. That changed in V13, I think. I, I completely agree you should do that. But maybe you can do the verify more often uh, than uh, Yeah, yeah, of course. Or. You can do the verify. In the back, yeah. Run, Daniel, run. Uh, do you know if there will be a Docker image for PG Backrest at some point? An official one, I don't think so, but... Uh, okay. Well, it's just a matter of... Well, usually we need to connect to the local socket directory, so when you use containers and so on, it's not that easy to to do, usually what we do when we have containers, we need to install pitch backrest on site, uh, inside the container itself. That's the best thing you can do. So usually you take the image you want and then you take a Docker file and just put backrest on top of it. And I think the, the image from Zalando's PID.io is pretty good for that. Someone else? So one here. Don't worry, I don't bite. And if you have questions and don't want to be recorded, I will be there for the coffee break. Hi. Uh, just a, a simple question. Uh, you have the archive command, like you mm -hmm. saw in the configuration, which is the copy command, the Linux copy command. Did you ever consider to use the rsyn command? Well, yes, that's the archive command of Postgres. Basically, you can set any anything you want. I see a shaking <laughs> Yeah, because I'm coming that to that conclusion. Okay. I mean. The archive command I used as an example was a CP. You can, you can use rsync, you can use whatever you want for jzip, for anything you want. But in backrest, we have our own archive command, which is a archive push. So when you need to, well, that's what's what I meant in the disclaimer. I mean, you need to know what the internals of backrest are when you initially set up. You need to stand like create, you need to enable the archive command, you need to use archive push of PG backrest in the archive command, and we will check. We will ensure that you are using that for the archive command, <laughs> otherwise you can't take a backup, for example. So yeah, you can't use rsync or cp with backrest because we have our own archive command. You can do that in Postgres, but if you use pitch backrest, you need to use our archive command. Okay, within the context of... Uh... Within the archive command of Postgres, yes. Just to follow up on that slightly, um, don't ever use CP or rsync as an archive command. It's terrible. Don't ever do that. I mean, he use was, the backrest doing, one. He was doing it as an example, like just simple setup, but yeah, use backrest. Okay. Thank you. We wanted to compare the initial Postgres archive command that you do every day and see what we can do with backrest to improve that. And to improve that, well, we don't rely on CP or rsync. We rely on our own archive pull command. One last, I think. Yeah. We have a coffee break. In addition to archive command, we see recently archive library or something like that. Uh, have you tried any libraries uh, 
does it bring anything? Well, we don't have an official archive library for backrest, and I don't uh, think we not, will. Not for backrest, uh, for any uh, any tool, just for comparison. If uh, it is. Uh, I've not seen an archive library released library by any approach. tool, anyway. Mm -hmm. okay. I kind of was pretty close to the Barman developers a few months ago, and that's not out, and that will be difficult to reach anyway. And you will need an archive library for S3, an archive library for anything. At, at some point, the current archive library in Postgres is a simple CP, so it's no, no really meaning. The country example is very basic. Do you mind if I jump in? So archive library is something that, I mean, PG Backrest, we are interested in supporting eventually, um, but uh, at the moment we don't, I mean, the archive command works just fine. Like archive library would be more useful for tools that don't have PG backrests, async, archiving, um, you know, capabilities already. We're, we already yeah. have all of that. So yeah, archive yeah. library is, is interesting. We don't have any specific, like, immediate goals of adding it. We do want to add support for it kind of eventually because we think it could be useful. But uh, if you are aware of reasons to use it specifically, then that would be interesting to, to talk to us about. Sorry for making this in a discussion, but I, I had a question and it relates to this. Uh, Anders Freund had a talk about Direct.io. That could be one of the reasons why you want a library because if you have Direct.io doing the wall uh, writes, the, the the buffers of the wall are not in your kernel page cache. And if you use the copy command, you actually basically lose all the benefit of the direct IO. And whereas you could use a library, uh, Postgres itself could push the buffers. Yeah, but that's anyway, you need to push it. But to that's like five somewhere. releases in the yeah, future. It's not today. You need to store it somewhere anyway. You need to push it to F3. You need to push you it need to, to push it, but you may not need to read it from disk. So that's yeah. the, 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 that's, but that's, that's uh, the, the future. <laughs> <coughs> the, the last slide you had, you had this remark, uh, there is no mechanism. Oh, sorry. Does it work? Okay. Uh, well, there is no use in making backups if you do not restore them. But I know that it will not happen until you uh, automate this. Yeah, so that's why I'm working on automating uh, rest restoration of backups. Is there any feature in PG Backrest that will support that? Well, what, what can we do what for do that? I, I mean, have you have to run the restore command and you have to eventually get, well, I've got a, a slide in which is either hidden here because I didn't have time to put everything in it, but we have um, PG wall inspect um, in the last version of Postgres that you can do, that you can use as a view to get the latest LSN. And then you probably want to just make sure you trigger your restore command you let Postgres restore, so you let the default restore happen, and then you select PG current while LSN, and you compare that. Is my system able to keep up with what's inside my production system or not? You can automate the checks, but you can't really automate anything, anything else. I mean, you need to run the restore command, and then you need to let Postgres do the recovery. And if you want to check, to have a check on where it went, actually, you can use that. Okay, we have a coffee break. We can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs>